everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. Now is our time to start this week's session. I'm glad to see you all here today. We have an unusual and very exciting project with some great guests. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. What I'd like to introduce to all of you is a program called the 100 Year Project. It's a new way of thinking about educational technology. The idea is to look back in the past from what we've learned from the history of educational technology and then extrapolate forward to see all told 100 years of where educational technology has gone and where it might take us. In order to do that, in order to have that conversation, I want to bring on board three of its leaders. So let me just begin by moving from left to right by starting off with our good friend Lev Gomick. And let's see if he is here right now. Hello, Lev. Hey, Brian. Great to be with you. Good to see you, sir. Very good to see you. And congratulations on the announcement this morning of Arizona State University's uh, ChatGPT program. Congratulations. Just another day in the life of Arizona State University. Uh, it is. You guys are tremendous. So, Lev, we'd like to ask people to introduce themselves in the forum in an unusual way. Instead of the academic obituary fashion describing what you've done, we ask you to say, what are you working on for the next year? So, Lev, just tell us what's coming up for you. What are the big projects and the big ideas for the next year for you? Well, uh, thanks, Brian, first of all, and hi, everybody. Uh, you may have stolen one of my headlines for what I've been working uh, on, and uh, that is um, all things uh, AI uh, at ASU, uh, sort of in the spirit of the Doug Engelbart tradition, we think of it as as very much about augmenting, uh, you know, human intelligence and all things uh, uh, in that journey. And uh, today, as Brian shared, we we made a I think a really fun and exciting new announcement with a collaboration on blueprinting that future with um, OpenAI. Uh, and you know, looking forward to our journey and hopefully inviting you all to be part of that as well. Secondly. You know, uh, Brian, things that we are working on that I am, you know, definitely spending time and cycles on uh, is figuring out, uh, you know, how to further the work that we're doing in uh, XR and uh, mm. specifically in our VR work. Some folks may have heard of our Dreamscape Learn initiative, which is a terrific collaboration and uh, it is going deeper uh, and uh, faster uh, in many uh, disciplines. We started with biology, now we're doing chemistry. Earth and space oh, science, uh, art history. I mean, it, that's fabulous work. And the other piece that I'm personally spending quite a bit of time on and would love to come back another time to chat with you all, but perhaps sure. if some of you are going to join us for the 100 year project, we can talk also about the ways in which we create a, a ecosystem of platform technologies to support uh, transferring of credits, digital credits for not only things like the typical stuff that you would think is. Uh, which is to say courses, but all evidence of learning that goes on. And we have a project called the Trusted Learner Network, uh, which starts wow. with learner sovereignty in terms of owning their own learning journey uh, and um, have uh, a fabulous international collaboration on that. So those are just three things that are keeping me busy. Well, those are immense things. And uh, I'm just delighted to hear about them. And Lev, yes, I would love to bring you back to talk about the network. That would be terrific. And. I've got to ask because outside here is about 25 degrees. Well, what's the weather like there? Uh, it's relatively chilly. I think uh, it's sort of uh, mid 60s, but if you uh, give oh, me no. a, <laughs> uh, but the, such as the winter chill, you can sort of see I'm wearing my, yeah, it's, it's only 68 degrees. And so, um, yes, it's such, such as it is uh, here, uh, as you know, and one of the reasons we're hosting the 100 year project in Scottsdale at the end of February is that elsewhere in the country, it's typically not as, uh, as uh, a nice weather. Quite true, quite true. Well, I'm delighted you could join us, Lev, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Let, let me bring on stage your uh, colleagues, your co-conspirators, and, uh, and let's, see, let's bring them on for their conversation as well. So, uh, Stephanie, hello. Hello, how are you? Oh, excellent, excellent. Very good to see you. And and where are you today? I am in Scottsdale, Arizona today, where it's 61 degrees. <laughs> uh, I see there's a theme coming up here. There's a theme. Yes. Well, I, I'm so glad you could join us. And I'm so happy with all the work you've been doing with Shaping EDU. Let, let me, along those lines, let me ask the same question I put to Lev. What are you going to be working on for the next year? Um, the 100 Year Project is a huge part of, of what I will be working on. I also have a couple of other projects that um, may be of interest to this group. One is called Playposium, and it's about playful pedagogy and the importance of 
how it addresses uh, mental health crisis, loneliness crisis, teacher retention, and student retention. Um, so that's, yeah, we're doing an event for that in LA next month. And then we have obviously the 100 year project uh, design summit coming up here in Scottsdale. And then uh, we have another event that later in the year that uh, we're working on with the uh, Swedish American Chamber of Commerce to pull the Amidalen concept that they've developed uh, since 1968, where the country basically shuts down for uh, a week and academia, industry and government come together to address Sweden's biggest challenges. So we are taking that concept uh, as inspiration and developing Amidalen in Arizona. Oh, wow. Wow. I yeah. wouldn't know about that. I've never put Sweden and Arizona together, but that's a great idea. They, they are very inspirational folks, and it's no coincidence that they are one of the happiest countries in the world, given the sense of hope and agency that a system like this brings. Oh, it's a great country. It's a great country. Well, um, it sounds like you're going to be busy as heck. You are a, a one-woman army. I'm so glad to hear it. <laughs> um, and, uh, and maybe uh, that Swedish inspired project, maybe we could bring you back to talk about it once um, you know, later on down the road. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, uh, let me add uh, one more member uh, uh, to your troika. Let me bring uh, the uh, a ringleader on stage uh, and let me add him to the mix. We have Joe Lambert. Hello, sir. What do you know? Brian and Joe are back together again. It's great to be here. Since you've already asked the question, I'll answer it. You know, I'm I'm keeping my little nonprofit going. The, the 2023 was a challenging year for my nonprofit, but we're we're very excited about one thing we're working on, which is the next international digital storytelling conference will leave the northern hemisphere where it's been uh, since 2006 and go to Belém, Brazil, because the COP28 will be in in Balaam. And so, uh, you know, we're trying to connect. I, I actually take it back to COP30, right? The, the COP30, 28 just happened. And so we're trying to link our work in digital storytelling to some of these big uh, pressing issues around climate change and around, you know, what we're going to be doing to deal with the impact of climate change in all the contexts. And so oh, you'll see that that theme that theme will be more front and center with Story Center in the coming year, and it's front and center in the Hundred Years Project. So let's transition to talk a little bit about that. Well, I can't and wait. I, to, I, say, I can't I'm, wait to hear about that. I'll just say it, it. It's a super pleasure for me to have gotten to work with Stephanie and Lev over the last year on this project, and and I'm deeply thankful. And Stephanie and I are both excited to hear Lev. You know give us the background on this. So I'll turn it over to you, Brian. Well, it's, it's great to see you. And, and uh, I'm glad all of you could make the time. And I have a personal connection with each of you. Um, Lev is someone that uh, I've worked with off and on back when he was in Ohio, as well as in Arizona. And of course, Stephanie uh, with uh, Shaping EDU and Joe is co-founder of the Digital Storytelling Movement. Um, so three very, very special people. Uh, let me ask, by the way, if you're new to the forum, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our guests a couple of questions to get things rolling. But then I'd like to turn it over to you all with your questions and comments. So as Lev and as Stephanie and as Joe speak about their work and show you a bit of it, um, think about what you'd like to know more of. And, you know, hit the chat box, but also get ready to hit the Q&A box. And of course, if you'd like to join us uh, on stage, um, just hit the raised hand button. My first question is, why the hundred year project? What are you what are you hoping to accomplish with this framing that we don't already have? Brian, maybe I can start. And again, I think it's uh, it's meant to be intentionally provocative. I mean, the whole idea of a hundred years uh, is obviously a different um, arc uh, and a different framing of the times where more times than not, most of us have, a, including myself, have a hard time thinking beyond the sort of tyranny of the urgent or the most, the thing sucking the air out of the room on a particular ed tech um, 
technology and or set of initiatives. So but we are, this is a, a bit of a invitation to the privilege of thinking in much longer horizons uh, than is typically afforded. And um, as Stephanie shared, and this is very much, and, and Joe shared as well, it's very much a design focused activity. The, the way we sort of started it, uh, Brian, was uh, if you sort of look to some of the very, very early activities uh, that happened in our community. It's about 50 years ago uh, mm -hmm. that you know, you know we started to see uh, the conversations that had, that now are some almost 60 years ago in the broader mm -hmm. technology space begin to find their intersections, uh, you know, inside what we now understand uh, as the sort of educational technology space. There's some terrific archives, uh, you know, that have been written, open archives that have been written about these those early days. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, you know, what we did, and again, under Joe's fabulous facilitation, you know, we had a, a gathering, a first design session, uh, actually uh, in beautiful New Mexico, uh, near Santa Fe in a gorgeous, uh, fantastic setting. Uh, and we really kind of did the retrospective. What what has happened over the last 50 years? And I, I've already sort of invoked the, the Doug Engelbard framing of it because of course that was 1969. And obviously that's more than 50 years ago, but when we took a look at um, all the kinds of technologies and as it were in sort of inspirations for the art of the possible, uh, we found ourselves working around and massaging many of those themes and carrying them out to approximately the present time. Um, and then again, very much organically from the 25 or so folks who were part of that. And I've already put in the chat the website of the 100 year project that you can definitely take a, a look at. Uh, you know, we began sort of uh, laying out and putting together uh, opportunities for thinking for the next 50 years and not just sort of again for like what has to happen next week, next month, next quarter, next, next year even uh, to try to think about, you know, the ways in which we as humans interested in education can leverage technology to achieve you know more mm -hmm. greater humanity better understanding of our relationship to each other and to the earth um, and to the things that matter uh, along the way and again i think uh, joe is the consummate storyteller you know has created a kind of a, a an arc of conversations uh to try to advance that work and I'm, i know he's going to share more about that Oh, thank you, Lev. Thank you. Lev, Stephanie, do, do you want to add more to uh, uh, Lev's great introduction? Sure, yeah. I think that um, it's interesting to look at last year was the 100th anniversary of technology in the classroom. So that's the first recorded instance of a radio being brought into a classroom to enhance the, the experience. Um, so here we are 100 years later. We look around our classrooms. They look very similar to as they did back then. Uh, so what is what is the experience going to be for the learner and how do we give them agency in that process um, over the next 50 years? We have to be very intentional about it and be proactive rather than reactive and getting the right people in the room to have that conversation is, is what this event's all about. Oh, great. Well, taking us back to radio. That's excellent. That's excellent. <laughs> yes. I, you know, the, the thing I would add is that I think... Some of us, you know, I'm about 40 years into my career. Some of us kind of see this 40, 50 year period as the gener the big generational shifts. And I've got a 21 year old undergraduate daughter at the University of Puget Sound in biology. Mm. And I'm sort of imagining her as me 50 years from now. You know, basically, I, she was born when I was 47. So it's almost like, who would this person be and what will they have to journey through? And what are we doing to prepare? So the approach, you know, we took after a lot of discussion was to provide people with a postcard from characters who are existing in 2074, who actually are the elders of that period, maybe deeply integrated with the younger generations underneath who they're working with. But we sort of hear them say, wouldn't it have been great if... <laughs> Back in the 2020s, when you were dealing with all those things, you thought about this or you dealt with that or you prepared us for things like the endless climate related crises that all of us are seeing right now and will continue to see. What are we doing in our educational institutions to make that possible? 
So the, the theory of the design, the conference, and the, the approach that will be taken is we'll, we'll have a setup where we'll start with young people and their perspective. Then we'll move to a kind of middle generation uh, subject matter experts framing these big emergent trends of AI and automation and virtual virtuality through AI or XR. AR. And the idea then is that there will be working sessions where people will be thinking about these uh, narratives from the future. I call them postcards from the future, mm-hmm. and and drawing out what are some of the critical issues in research, what are the cri- critical issues in policy, what are the kinds of things we'll do with curriculum, and certainly about the context in which education. So the small groups will work toward that with the idea that we're moving toward an outcome that we hope will be a solid report, but also a series of tools, not exactly in the organization of a toolbox, but but everybody in our retreat at Ghost Ranch last year said we need to keep innovating ideas about what you can do to prep for the massive changes that we're, we're expecting. And, wow. and so there will be some you know, I'm working on a game. <laughs> There'll be things like a game. There'll be things like, how do you tell stories from the future? Yeah. And and that's the kind of thing we want uh, people to walk away. We, we are also going to ritualize the experience where they're going to bring their ancestors in at the beginning and exit with a commitment to change something in their lives huh. and in their professional environment. Wow. Wow, this sounds like a fantastic event. And by the way, just to, just to look ahead from the forum perspective, first of all, the bottom left of the screen, you should see a tan colored button and that will take you to the 100 year project uh, webpage. Um, but also we're gonna do a live session uh, from the event itself about a month from now, which I, I'm really looking forward to. Um, th- this sounds like just as, as your futurist here, I'm just delighted by this. Um, and uh, I'm wondering, Joe, do you, do you want to give us a try of uh, showing a couple of these uh, short uh, stories? Yeah, I, you know, my hope was that uh, these stories would give people a little bit of idea how this would work. So, mm-hmm. so Joe, maybe you can tell us a, a little overview of that. Yeah, that we'll just story. we'll do it as people uh, have the idea. Each of what will be 10 scenarios take characters from around the planet who are facing educational dilemmas. In this case, how campuses will react when a large number of refugees caused by some environmental disaster are suddenly needing to be integrated into the campus life. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, the, the campus will become one of the institutions for climate refugees to to sustain themselves. We note that, you know, some of the institutions are ready with their integration into communities to handle that, but many institutions won't be ready. And we're already seeing these sort of situations with fires and, you know, disasters. I I heard University of Oregon is in the middle of an ice crisis. (laughs) Uh-huh. And, you know, inevitably, that's one of the ideas. But we then talk into the cultural issues of AI. We talk about the way that digital addiction will become something that many people will suffer. Even as we're giving people these tools, we're realizing people are getting lost inside some of these places. We talk about the impact of automation and how many, many, many professions will be affected. And how, what will that do to people whose parents are going to go through this massive reorganization of labor in the mid-century. All of these things are speculated about by people like Kim Stanley Robinson and and the futurists in the science fiction world. But we're we're trying to say, no, these are pretty real uh, likelihoods. And how do these stories stir up something? How do you tell a story about the future? Well, you need a way to illustrate it. And if we had to pay for the illustrations, it would have been a $100,000 project. We used Midjourney AI to generate the visual material. So it's also from a digital storytelling standpoint, a kind of new mechanism for doing scenario storytelling. And this is something I did with the Institute for the Future for several years back in the late 90s. 
where we were telling stories into the future and trying to come up with what would be the illustration. Mid Journey and Meta, amazing what what it can help you create. And I don't think it's art, but it's it's part of the process of of our doing new kinds of work. That's a great way of putting it. Uh, well, why don't we uh, why don't we take two minutes and uh, everybody take a look at this video. I think we come back, you know, I, of course, the one I sh shared was the longest of the, all of them. So I just realized that when I looked at it. But I think I, hopefully people get a taste. I think it's kind of clear what these are intended to do. I think that the what's going to be fascinating is how people work through these stories toward their own vision of what they would imagine would change in their own work and, and the kinds of issues that that we expect you know to address in depth at the conference at the I, think this, I think this is a great example i mean uh i love the way that you've used all the ai art that's really appropriate including the autonomous uh quad buggies which is great um i loved seeing the uh, people which i know is essential to any good story uh, and i loved hearing the voice of the narrator uh, which really brought that home in a, in a very very intimate way uh, I'm just curious. Uh, just just before before we go further, uh, what the rest of you will have thought? How, what do you what do you make of that story? Uh, and again, if you want to uh, hit the Q and A box, or if you want to raise your hand and join us on stage, we can fit a few more people. Um, uh, Roxanne Riskin, our good friend, says in the chat that the the ease of using AI to generate multimedia removes a large barrier of uh, time and needing to hire expert designers too. Uh, Chris Jones says this is inspirational. Uh, and here's a question for the three of you, a quick question. Uh, Meryl Krieger asks, can we share out this video? I can envision a couple of different class topics and projects that would be really helpful. Lemon's waving his head. I'd think? say maybe after, after the event, uh, we'll have some feedback from the participants in the room and be able to uh, potentially enhance it a bit. So uh, we're, we're, we are also looking forward to video recording people's reactions and creating a montage out of that as mm -hmm. well. And so mm -hmm. I, I concur with Stephanie. I was not trying to do something that was <laughs> ambivalent. I was just, I uh, thanks Stephanie. I agree with you. And, uh, you know, we invite you all to, you know, if you're interested to, as Stephanie has offered in the chat, you know, be in touch. Uh, Brian, obviously we're looking forward to, to you uh, joining us and participating and through your network, uh, sharing the follow on. There are a number of, deliverables uh you know that, that we're already anticipating some that we want to just be serendipitously you know sort of open to what might have uh you know might just unfold but you know there definitely will be some products uh that we anticipate that kind of frame this 50-year horizon through the scenarios uh, through the game uh framework that we hope people will be able to take away with them and use in their own context whether that's formal education informal on the edge of education uh, in museum settings, I mean, uh, the list of people and uh, who were part of our first design session, as well as you know, the second design se session, come from a fairly diverse uh, set of uh, education, uh, and we've done our level best to curate uh, the participation. So it is an invitational, and so in this case, you are all friends of Brian, um, and that's probably good enough uh, for us. Uh, just if you do, uh, you know, choose to join us at the event live just say that you're from your friends of brian alexander and, and you're well on your way uh, but there will be about it's only going to be about 150 people it's not a you know it's not meant to be a, a massive gathering because we actually want to do continue to do work together get to know each other better um and learn from each other and uh and use the creative storytelling framework uh as you know as really as the vehicle for engaging in what we hope will be deeper conversation uh and uh, there are relatively few presentations uh, as part of this work. Oh, excellent. Excellent all around. Um, just want to share a couple of quick thoughts. You have, uh, obviously, you have uh, fans and supporters in the uh, in the audience today. Um, uh, Chris Jones echoed the call for this to be available. Uh, so, you know, you can see that uh, there's, there's definite interest in it. Uh, Karen uh, mentioned something really interesting. Uh, as a Florida resident, having been through various hurricanes, I'm very familiar with aspects of this as to how no one can predict all of that. Another Floridians are chiming in here. 
Um, now, John Hollenbeck um, points out an uh, interesting point. He says, it's distressing to think we'll be in classrooms and dormitories, classrooms and pedagogy. Um, so that's a, a, another long-term one. And then uh, our, our friend Lisa says, this is one of the most depressing things I've seen. So I, I recommended it to her my most recent book, just in case she was feeling too <laughs> Yes, more depression. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, Brian, one thing that I want to add is that one of the deliverables from this design summit will be um, uh, part of this report, which will be free and accessible to all who don't have the resources that we necessarily have. Um, we're also creating a manifesto, and it's really a call to action. Uh, and we're designing that, we're co-creating that throughout the design summit, and we will definitely share that out as part of the report, uh, which will be a multimedia report. So we're looking forward to that. Great. Excellent. Excellent. I'm really glad to hear that. Um, we have another question um, from Chris, and this is like a perfect bridge transition question. What are the other scenarios in this set? And I'm sure Joe says, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> you know, I go down, we have interspecies communication, which, you know, I just saw an, an article about a 20 minute conversation with a whale and some scientists. So, you know, we're projecting out, but it, a lot's going on. You know, we have, we have, again, I mentioned digital addiction, the kind of mental health caused by automation crisis. You know, we've, we've spread these stories around, um, you know, the, the different kind of people that, that, that we have in our network. So the voiceovers are done by a lot of my friends and colleagues. But there's a piece about um, physical enhancement and competition and the degree to which, you know, things like gender fluidity and, and identity will be built into to enhancement and non-enhancement uh, organic Olympics as opposed to the enhanced Olympics. The idea, those ideas are, are you know, one of the stories. Um, what am I leaving out? You know, you put me on the spot to remember my nine. Well, it's okay. You want me to things in the playlist? No, I mean, you know, genetically modified teaching in a post-truth era is about uh, <laughs> an imagined character at a small campus called New Albion that that mm -hmm. who is greatly limited, and it sort of imagined what would happen if DeSantis's approach to New College in Florida was was executed across the country, <laughs> you know, who would be the sort of surviving academics trying to find the right language? And, and in this case, a way to talk about evolution without getting fired. So there are things that I would say fall into the political, you know, realm, because we know the, the politics of democracy and autocracy are going to be critical in this next, and any of us that thinks we'll get through 2024 without having to confront that, um, I mean, some of us think that that those are immediate issues of how educators can function in an, under an autocratic uh, situation. So, again, I think you guys get the idea. We, we didn't cover them all. And what we want to do is encourage people to make their own. And this is something Story Center will, you know, evolve a way to, to assist people. And I, I hope a little guide is one of the things that can come out of this. We've talked about a little paint by numbers template for people to write into a scenario at either a decade ahead or two decades ahead, or in this case, five decades ahead. So that that's another tool we would imagine coming out of this process. Excellent. That sounds terrific. Um, that just, this all sounds great. Um, and I would add, uh, did you mention the permaculture scenario? I didn't, you know, I have a colleague here who's a Australian uh, who does youth work. And I imagine her as a performing artist turned media artist turned permaculture expert uh, teaching the three sisters the, the squash, corn, uh, <laughs> yeah. mix, you know, bean um, mix as a, a kind of late 21st century performance art, uh, permaculture as performance art. So they, again, is a little bit of what we're trying to imagine. But I think all of everybody here could tell a story like that, and it might be useful for a planning process like this one. I think so. I think so. Uh, friends, I, I, I've got I've got more questions, but I want to hear more from all of you, too. Um, 
what would you like to, what, would you, what else would, would you like to see in these kinds of stories? Uh, what else would you like to know about how they were made? And how is this helping you think about education technology in this, in this framing? So again, just, you know, use the chat box and of course the, the Q&A box, as you've just seen, and you can join us on stage. This is, um, this, this panel here is one of those panels which disproves the myth that you have to have a beard in order to be on the forum. Uh, so uh, we did have one question from uh, John Hollenbeck, or actually a theme that he's been asking, uh, which is about pedagogical changes. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious, in, in your envisioning of the next 50 years, what are some pedagogical transformations that the three of you have been thinking about or that you've heard from other people involved in this project? Certainly in the, the first design session, you know, one of the themes that seemed to be tracking, you know, 50 years ago forward, you know, was a general trend uh, towards making real the long time aspiration and promise of a learner centered uh, set of frameworks. Um, and I think the uh, sort of the autonomous or sovereign learner, um, uh, interesting because I think a part of that was reflected by the people who were in the room who themselves are fairly sovereign, autonomous, didactic learners themselves uh, sort of felt like that that was one of the themes that you know might well carry on into uh, this next design session. And again, I, I'm not, you know, I, I would not be sort of prognosticating, but certainly, you know, if the uh, AI journey continues to unfold, one could well imagine, you know, uh, relationships to the machine in a way that are a little bit different than just a dystopian uh, views that uh, you know certainly are important sort of uh, again in sort of black swan scenarios but uh, perhaps there are also more uh, optimistic if not utopian scenarios that continue to support autonomous and sovereign learning uh, pieces that uh, that's one theme that you know just in quick response brian to the question i'm sure stephanie or joe may have reflections as well please thank you joe all right joe well, no, I mean, I, I, I think this is the essential idea of inventing. You know, we, we don't really think we're prognosticating the future. We're not saying we think we know what's going to happen. We're saying part of our role now is to invent contexts that respond to trends and that we realize things like the autonomous uh, learner and the sovereign learner are things that we've already seen just coming out of the the pandemic, the shifts. And so what more? And, you know, I have to say, Arizona State University is is perhaps the most interesting campus in the country right now because of its commitment. And I see it in the field of the arts where I come from to putting innovative people in the same laboratory, meaning the whole campus is a laboratory. And I think more campuses need to follow that lead of making it, you know, we, we overuse the world innovation, but a place where invention is inherent. It's like, we have a problem, let's address it with new ideas, with new visions. And yes, I would hope, like Lev says, they're more utopian than dystopian. A lot of us come from the tradition of, of techno-utopian techno perspective, and we haven't given up. <laughs> We're still trying to use these tools for the best uses to make the best humans to create a healthy safe diverse you know uh functioning planet sustainable planet so you know asu's role in this is critical and so i i hope all of you take a look at what we do but also at the other things that are happening with shaping edu with many of the different uh institutes and organizations that are there of which you know i've had the pleasure to work with several of them but but i'm learning new things about that campus all the time Excellent. and and i would add that it's Please. one of the critical components of this design summit is that we are co-creating the future together mm -hmm. this is a, we've created a forum and an environment for people to uh feel like they have a method of con contributing to what the future is, not that it's happening to them, but they are actually co-designing it with us. Uh, so I think that's a really critical piece mm -hmm. of this, uh, having that sense of agency in, in the future. And so um, to the point about the future being, some of these scenarios being a little depressing, I think that's where we get to put a different hat on and say, okay, it doesn't have to be this way. It, well, how do we prevent this from happening? 
or how do we proactively deal with it if it's inevitably going to happen um, together? And we're not alone in this process. We have this community um, which we will convene repeatedly over over the next uh, 50 years <laughs> uh, to procreate this together. Stephanie, I need to figure out how to clone you and bring you to campuses all over the world. <laughs> if you figure that out, let me know. <laughs> Working on it. That's going to be another story. Yeah. Uh, we have um, uh, we have uh, more chatter in the chat box appropriately, um, and uh, people have pointed out a uh, Star Trek. Um, uh, school that appeals to them, um, some calls inter interdisciplinarity, uh, and some calls for a type of teaching that I've always mispronounced, which I think is hudigaji. Um, and uh, uh, see, Karen has shared some about that, uh, which is very good. Um, and again, let me just say, if there's any, uh, remind everybody for questions for this process, um, please you know, put them in the Q&A box or, or raise your hand. Um, we have uh, uh, some more comments um, about uh, Carolyn. I think this is Carolyn of JPL, uh, who says that uh, she doesn't see instructors going away. Um, so that part of the that labor aspect is uh, who's still being there. Um, the question is how they get to teach and, and, and what they get to work. Um, and, and the role, are they more navigators, uh, guiding possibly. students through the process that the students have more agency in determining what, what that path is. Um, I, I think the role of, of educators will change and, and we have to be ready for that. Indeed, indeed, I agree. Well, thinking about this then, let me ask this from, uh, from a, a different angle. Um, when you have all of these stories together and you also have the other features, you have the tools, you have the templates, you have the game or games uh, that are involved, um, where do you go with this next after you've got a, um, a report or some different multimedia documents and then you want to put this out into the world? Do you actually you know, make this an annual event where you keep coming back? Uh, or do you, is, is there another way you'd like to do this? Uh, you know, virtual events or, for example, take advantage of XR that Lev mentioned right away uh, and have an XR based event? I mean, where, where do you go with all this? All of the above. <laughs> No, I, I definitely uh, see this being an annual event and having some virtual components so we can have uh, a more diverse group with different perspectives from around the world, um, as well as more students contributing as well. That's something we're really excited about is the students from the Next Generation Service Corps, um, who are very future focused, uh, will be joining us for this event and uh, offering their input. Yeah, I would just say that one of the fun things of the first design session, and we are you know, we are designing it into the second session, is actually those voices, diverse voices of young uh, learners uh, that are out there. Uh, and uh, I think that you know, we certainly gleaned insights. Uh, some of them were uh, provocative and other than them were, were maybe a bit more predictable. Um, you know, we certainly, uh, by the way, uh, I should just also add in addition to young learners uh, that are being invited. Uh, here at ASU, we have an interesting senior living uh, team, called, uh, a project called Mirabella. And we've just started to selectively, we've asked for two uh, members of the Mirabella community to also participate. Uh, they are even older than I am. Uh, and uh, they will be uh, invited to join us and, and bring wisdom, which is perhaps one of the things we might say come with aging, or at least I'd like to think so. Um, and uh, that's another learner community uh, that uh, I think, you know, again, we're trying to be intentional by design. Uh, for those of you who are interested, the Mirabella Project is a fantastic initiative of a community uh, living arrangement that is uh, mm -hmm. essentially a, a campus in the campus uh, here in the Tempe area uh, with uh, services for uh, recently uh, seniors, whatever that even means by age these days, all, all, mm -hmm. all the way through continuum of care um, and uh, with with fabulous integration into uh, the, the life of the young learners as well, uh, being uh, mentors, uh, tutors, uh, and as well, all those people all essentially getting an ASU ID and being able to participate in the life of the campus. So, you know, it is part of what Joe was sort of saying earlier about ASU. Uh, it is sort of in the spirit of inventing uh, the future uh, in a way that is, you know, again, definitely not the traditional 
uh, role of a university. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, what we'd like to do is, is get more input for other ideas, whether it happens at, at, at this organization called the ASU or uh, a museum environment or a community based uh, learning project, coding camps. I mean, all the things that are going out there to not predetermine what the outcome is. Uh, that's not kind of what the goal here it is. It is, as Stephanie said, to be as generative and catalytic as it can be. And, uh, you know, the idea of hosting a regular uh, set of sessions, you know, again, it'll all depend on kind of what the value is uh, as the particip participants see it. But uh, we certainly have had lots and lots of interest. Uh, and, uh, you know, whether it's a regular convening or a virtual convening, such as the one you're hosting today, Brian, you know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll sort of figure that out. And who knows what the, those technologies in the future are mm -hmm. going to afford us. And it was certainly very interested uh, in the in-world opportunities, uh, letting people uh, mm -hmm. explore that uh, environment uh, in ways that we hope will be intuitive and uh, fun at the same time. Oh, excellent. And Excellent. I would just add about the Mirabella community. Most of them are retired educators. So we really, really? get that firsthand perspective of oh. what the last 50 years looked like from the classroom um, as a learner and, a, and an educator. Wow. Wow. That's terrific. Um, I, I you know, what we should do is we should have a session there um, entirely yes. about uh, senior learning. Well, we have a, a, a comment or a question that has come in from uh, Noah Geisel who asks, are some of the main outcomes for participants less about the exercises of predicting and more about diving into critical thinking and reflection about our roles and responsibilities in the future? Okay. Stephanie, you just started nodding vigorously. I, yes, yes. I think it's not, we're not looking for, you know, the magic eight ball to help us figure mm -hmm. out what's going on. We're, we're really looking at, okay, how do we approach the future with an anti-fragile mentality and be prepared for whatever is thrown at us. Um, and we can do that in, in this group. So we're really cultivating a, a futures focused mindset and exploring how everyone can, in a participatory way, uh, design the future together. Mm. That's, that's what I think futures work does best. Um, I, I definitely agree. Uh, friends, we're coming up to our last five minutes here, and uh, I, I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to uh, uh, to get in, to share their thoughts, and to uh, put their questions up. Um, we have uh, um, uh, oh, Giselle LaRose. Oh, let me just share this because Giselle is a great person. I think she's coming to you from New Orleans right now, uh, and she says, "I commend the committee. I look forward to participating." Uh, Giselle does a lot of work with uh, making uh, webinars productive um, and through her Web Study Foundation, which is terrific. So, hey, Giselle, good to uh, meet you in Brian's form. Uh, thanks for sending me a note yesterday. Yeah, Giselle is great, and that's one of the things we do in the forum is we network like mad. Um, we had some more interest in the Mirabella community from the chat. Um, uh, Roxanne Riskin, our good friend, says that she's heard of Horizon Seniors. Uh, it's the same. It's the same up in Portland. It's the yeah. same same uh, developer, although this one was co-developed with us here at ASU. Okay, people over seventy five, seventy five plus. She says. Yeah, this is less less about age specific. Okay, and then uh, John Holland that gets even more age specific by says old people learning. Imagine that. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and and then we have some uh, uh, our good friend, uh, Mark Corbett Wilson, who I think we'll see there um, in Arizona, uh, says that this is the first time he's heard of uh, people talking about teaching seniors uh, for a while. So I, I think it's especially important. Let, let, let me ask a question. Uh, Joe seems to be having a with, uh, with connectivity. So uh, we'll have to circle back to him uh, with this afterwards. But I, I'm, I'm curious what you think about uh, demographic transition in terms of uh, our shrinking, you know, ultimately shrinking human population which will start to which will start to happen the last decade of this project, uh, as well as the dwindling number of children and the growing number of seniors, um, is that something that you all have been exploring in these stories? Absolutely, and and the stat I read last week, which was I'm still wrapping my head around it, is that less than ten percent of people involved in higher education by twenty thirty will be on a campus. So I, that's that does a lot to the landscape of, of what uh, will happen in the future, but also how we prepare to have 
the best experience using technology um, for future learners uh, of all ages is, is critical to the future success of, of education as a whole. So fewer than 10% of the people involved in academic enterprise will actually be on campus. And yep. the, re the rest is gonna be a combination of distance learning and work from home? Yes, yeah. And that's, so what does that do to the college experience, yeah. right? The traditional yeah. college experience, someone goes off and um, you know becomes part of a different community and has that kind of immersive experience. How do we replicate something like that to best prepare young learners for the future and to be successful uh, in their career path. It, it's a lot to process. <laughs> oh, that's a, it's a fantastic thing. I, um, um, there was a, a, a stat that, um, uh, I'm just blanking on his name, sorry, um, Phil Hill uh, was sharing uh, from federal data, which showed that about one third of students right now are taking classes entirely online. Uh, about one third are taking some of their classes online, and only about one third are taking all their classes online. You know, so consider that a snapshot on the way to what you just described. Stephanie, if, if you get a chance, if you could share where you found that um, that line, yes. people, people are clamoring for it in the chat. Uh, Happy to. Mm -hmm. Speaking of clamoring, while you're doing that, uh, let me. I'll start off by asking Lev this question. Um, what is the best way for people to keep up with this project and what are the best ways they can get involved? Can we start with a web page or? Yeah, yeah. I think the 100 year, which is still uh, highlighted there on the left hand side of the screen, uh -huh. uh, just below our, our uh, video screens here, uh, is the space. Uh, there uh, is, uh, again, a kind of a set of internal uh, organizational Slack channels that we're working on at some point. It may prove that we we'll use that or something else. Uh, to keep uh, some of the dialogue uh, going for those who are interested in the kind of the making of uh, work in terms of the product outputs. I'm sure there will be um, all kinds of uh, interesting ways for folks to to learn, to engage. Uh, you know, again, hopefully, Brian, you'll invite us back to uh, to a shindig uh, platform set of conversations over the next uh, period of time. And uh, certainly, uh, we'll do our best to uh, not abuse the social media world, but uh, try to keep f folks who are interested informed uh, and invite people to, to again, as Stephanie, Joe, and I have been saying through the hour, uh, to f feel this uh, as a genuine invitation to help us co-create uh, uh, the, you know, the, the many, many different pathways to learning for, for us, uh, you know, here in this community, as well as uh, hopefully to uh, do less harm than we have over the last 50 years to the planet uh, by being intentional about the ways in which uh, we leverage our knowledge uh, and the relationships that we have to machines, uh, you know, in the next 50 years. Oh, thank you. I, I like the way you think, Lev, uh, as always. And, and Stephanie, um, what's the best way we can keep up with you? Um, should we find you on LinkedIn? Uh, yes, LinkedIn is, is where I'm most active. So uh, please do Look for me there and uh, happy to connect with all of you. Very good. Uh, and Joe, again, has been having connection difficulties, but he put his email uh, in the chat. And of course, you can go to storycenter.org to find his digital star storytelling nonprofit enterprise right there. Um, it's, the, uh, it's the top of the hour here, so I'm afraid I have to wrap things up. But I want to thank both of you, uh, all three of you, for being just terrific guests. This is a, a project. That's just dear to my heart, and uh, I can't wait to see where it goes. Um, thank you both for your time and for your initiative in this project, and we'll look forward to talking to you very soon. Bye now, and thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. But don't go away yet, friends. Let me just wrap things up by saying if you'd like to keep talking about this, if you want to keep sharing stories and thinking about these ideas, um, we can do this over at the social media enterprise. Just go to F hashtag FTTE, and you can see all of my different uh, social media presences there, as well as my blog. If you'd like to dive into our previous sessions, which include some on storytelling and, of course, the future, look at tinyurl.com slash FTFarchive. Uh, if you want to look ahead to our upcoming sessions, we do have our follow-up session, again, in a month, along with one on mental health, one on college sports and the Department of Education, and still more. Uh, thank you all for being with us. This was an exciting session. Uh, I look forward to uh, circling back with us. In the meantime, I hope everybody there is safe and well. If you're in cold areas, I hope you stay warm. Uh, and I hope you're all very, very well. We'll see you next Thursday. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>